Well, first things first, let's try to get this thing together. It's packaged so ornately. That's very satisfying. <laughs> that feels better than it sounds. I feel bad putting my grubby fingerprints on this. When in doubt, just give it a little shaky shake. This is the most fragile piece of the entire thing. Okay. Welcome back guys. We got the enclosure together and today we are going to be building a bioactive terrarium, which I have not explained what that is yet. So what is a bioactive terrarium? You've seen my last couple of videos where I've gone over how to set up a basic snake enclosure and what makes a good starter snake, but there is uh, another step after what we would call conventional setups, which are just set up with uh, animals needs in mind, but not necessarily the extra mile to fully recreate uh, an ecosystem. So what we're going to be going over today is how to put together what's called a bioactive. You'll hear them referred to as bioactives or naturalistic terrariums or something like that, or a vivarium even. What that really comes down to is you are doing your absolute best to recreate a micro ecosystem inside of an enclosed space. One of the most convenient animals to do that with is actually a, a tarantula because of the size and because of how non-destructive tarantulas are with their environment. I'm also happen to be building this as a gift for a friend. And basically I'm gonna be using this enclosure as an example for each step in the process of creating a bioactive. And so this is a small example of a bioactive, but you can use the principles that I'm gonna take here and you can expand them or contract them to make a bioactive that's realistically as big or as small as you could possibly imagine. As long as it's got the same moving parts inside that make it that living ecosystem. And where does every single living ecosystem start? It starts with the soil. So the very first thing we're going to do is put some substrate in here. What makes a good bioactive soil is just whatever biome you're trying to recreate, you're looking for the clay versus loam versus humus versus sand structure of that soil that's gonna support the animal and the plants that you're trying to put into this bioactive. Depending on the species you're working with, there's a lot of really good sort of pre-made bioactive blends out there if you really just wanna take the guesswork out. I tend to use the BioDudes products just because he's got great blends and it takes all the guesswork out of me. But honestly, you guys can come up with your own blends as well as long as they hit that right ratio that's gonna foster good growth in your plants and foster the right humidity and the right you know burrowing conditions and things like that for your animal you can absolutely do your own blend but a lot of research goes into that and there are products out there on the market that kind of do all that research for you but of course those cost money that three quarts filled that tray so perfectly that's amazing and I almost bought two so this is your media layer this is your soil this is what's going to support all those little microorganisms that are going to be turning those wheels that make this tiny ecosystem work. And if I really break it down super simply, it's basically a big circle. You put in light, water, and food for your animal. Your animal then produce waste via dead feeders, via its own uh, excrement, via sheds, things like that. Those macro waste products are then broken down by your macro invertebrates like isopods and springtails, which I'll be showing you guys in a minute. Their waste product is much, much simpler compounds those products are then broken down by microorganisms, beneficial bacteria and beneficial fungi that you'll find in your soil. The waste products from those tiny organisms are usually straight plant food at that point. So that's why you wanna include the live plants as well, not just for aesthetics and not just for natural behavior for your animal, but also because they uptake a lot of those nutrients from the soil and that completes that cycle within your tiny ecosystem that you've created. On that note, now that we've got the soil in there, we are going to add the invertebrate layer. Where'd I put the bio shot? So what this is right here is essentially a little prepackaged bit of catatonic bacteria and fungi. It looks a lot like dirt and essentially it's all of the cultures for that bioactive media that you're gonna put in here in a sort of like suspended animation state. As soon as they get in here and they get wet and they incorporate into the soil, they come back to life and they start replicating as bacteria and fungi do. Um, and the reason why you wanna use this is you're probably going to get microfauna in your enclosure anyway. This sort of fills that role with something that you know and something you want in there before something you may necessarily not want in there gets in. And just incorporate that soil. 
So that's all mixed around nicely. Next, you really go wanna get the structure of your bioactive together first. Uh, before you put any of the live plants in there. This is the part where you would put in your biodegradable materials, which are very, very important. Your animal is going to produce waste and some of the other things like the food you put in are also going to produce waste. But to maintain the levels of microfauna that you want to really quickly handle all those waste products, you have to supplement that with a little bit of biodegradable matter of your own. And there are ways to do that that are still very attractive. For example, seed pods. This right here is a magnolia seed pod, heat treated, so there's no microbials or anything like that, but it is still a great piece of biodegradable matter that also provides some decorative touch that I'm going to find some sort of good spot for. And then also, I like magnolia a lot because it provides such a big, broad, pretty leaf that also is a fantastic biodegradable. It's non-toxic, um, and as long as you heat or freeze treat it, you can kill off any of the nasty microbials that might come in with it, the things you don't want in your enclosure. And you can break this up too. So you can either put you know, big leaves in there to have that sort of aesthetic forest floor look, but if you just wanna feed your animals, you can also break those leaves up into teeny tiny little chunks to provide a litter. This right here is a piece of spider wood which is basically a root cluster of a tree. And this is of course also treated and everything like that to make sure it's safe to put in here with this animal. Um, and this is a natural piece of wood that for an arboreal tarantula is going to create a nice, unique climbing structure. And then we're gonna plant our plant. I went with a bird's nest fern today, of course grown organically so that it couldn't have any pesticides or, or any of those other nasty chemicals that might affect your animal inadvertently. And this is going to be that plant that provides that nitrogen uptake. You wanna always custom tailor your plants to be ones that you know are going to fit into the biome that you're creating for your animal. So you know what your animal needs as far as humidity, as far as temperatures, as far as lighting requirements go ahead of time. And essentially you wanna pick the plants that are one, safe for that animal, and two, are going to thrive in that enclosure that you're replicating for that animal. So you tailor your plants to your animal, not the other way around. And then we're gonna do just a little, little chunky chunk spag moss. Spag moss is not only a very good long-term biodegradable, meaning it doesn't degrade super duper fast. It create it becomes a long, long-term food source for your animal, but it's also great for humidity retention too. So anytime you're doing like a tropical ecosystem or anything that's going to have sort of a high humidity gradient, spag moss is a fantastic way to not only create a cool aesthetic sort of jungly atmosphere on the ground level, but also retain that humidity that you want to make sure that that animal stays nice and moist. And it does not degrade as quickly as leaf litter. All right, so these guys that I'm holding in my hand, they're very diminutive, very hard to see, but these are actually the isopods. And there's also some springtails in here too. For a spider, I'm using one of the very, very small species of isopod that I cultivate known as dwarf white tropicals. They're very good at doing their job without being seen in the enclosure a whole lot. Um, and that's really good for a spider because if you use a larger species like dairy cows or giant oranges or something like that, your spider's probably going to eat a lot of them and they are not going to be able to breed as quickly. And sometimes some species aren't able to handle the humidity requirements that you're gonna need in something like a pink toe environment. Um, so I'm going with the dwarf white tropicals. They're a very good general utility species that's gonna be very, very good at covering a lot of ground and breaking down waste and not being very seen in the enclosure. There are those little tiny white specks that look kind of like grains of rice just hanging out right now. And I did just put them in here, so they're kind of in that, oh gosh, please don't eat me, Mr. Predator, freeze mode. But as soon as I put them in here, they'll scatter uh, amongst the leaf litter and the spag moss and go about their, go about their duties. If I can find a spot to put them. Isopods are a tiny terrestrial crustacean uh, group of species, and they are detrivores. They spend their time eating matter that is either starting to deteriorate or is about to deteriorate. Uh, they're also known as one of the very few animals out there who do eat just straight wood pulp. That's why uh, sometimes in the UK, you'll hear them referred to as wood lice. They are 100% safe for a bioactive. In fact, I consider them a very integral and important part of a bioactive because they are the ones that provide that first line of breaking down matter, be it the leaf litter, be it your animals, 
uh, waste products or, or anything like that. The other tiny organism that I definitely recommend you put into a bioactive are called springtails. And they are even smaller than isopods. They are also slightly detrivorous, but more than that, they love to eat mold. They are huge mold eaters. So when you get little mold blooms that are sometimes inevitable in these bioactive enclosures, if you have a booming springtail population, they will nip that mold right in the bud um, and you will not have to worry about it anymore. On that note, whenever you get a bioactive setup initially, uh, it is normal for there to be a small mold bloom at the beginning, which is why a lot of people choose to not keep their animal in that enclosure until those levels have sort of fluctuated and, and, and waned and come out to a nice even keel. And your springtails have gotten up to a population where they can handle the mold and the mold blooms have stopped and it's kind of evened out and is behaving like a natural soil would outside. Sometimes people will supplemental feed their isopods in an enclosure and they'll take like a little bit of yellow squash um, or a little bit of papaya or something like that and they'll put it in there or some greens and they'll put it in there and you'll notice your isopods come up like little zombies from the ground to consume that stuff. So that all together kind of creates your soil layer. There is a lot more you can do with it too. You can add soil aerators such as like earthworms and things like that as long as it's appropriate. Um, and there's all sorts of little additions. You can obviously add more plants. I only had this bird's nest fern here today that I was uh, willing to part with, but you can sort of make a, an enclosure as planted or not planted as you want. It comes down to aesthetics at that point. But as long as you have all the moving pieces in that enclosure that are operating to create that closed ecosystem or semi-closed, you know, we're putting in food, then you have established what is known in the industry as a bioactive enclosure. In my opinion, naturalistic terrariums that are trying to mimic these natural environments where these animals come from, that is the best way to stimulate natural behaviors, it is the best way to provide that kind of enrichment, it is the best way to keep these animals as stress-free as possible. There are absolutely appropriate ways to keep these animals not bioactive, but if you have the extra funds, it is definitely worth it. If for no other reason, then it's less cleanup. The last thing to add is the denizen. And of course, you can do a bioactive for any animal that lives in the wild because essentially where they live in the wild doesn't matter if it's the rainiest rainforest or the driest desert that ecosystem is bioactive those waste products go somewhere and there are animals that handle those waste products in every single ecosystem so be it arthropod be it reptile be it mammal be it whatever uh, there is a, a an ability to make a bioactive enclosure for that animal if you have any other questions feel free to reach out to us, leave a comment below, tell us what you liked, tell us what you disliked. Be sure to like and subscribe. That kind of support is literally what keeps me making these videos and keeps me able to keep giving you guys content like this. And last but not least, let's put our little darling in there to explore her new enclosure. Hopefully she's pleased.